Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now on to the next topic. We are, we're up and running. So I'm, I'm, like I said, Zach, I'm just, I'm happy to see our numbers continue to climb. We're hitting, we're hitting PR records. I'm I'm very competitive, man. (laughs) I like to see our numbers on our podcast keep going up and up and up and that's what's happening. So it's good to see. And it's good getting more messages out there, but um, and thank you so much for coming on for you guys. I know we have Dr. Ann Childers on here. She is a psychiatrist up in uh, Oregon uh, that has been, uh, I would say an advocate of at least a low carb style. Oh, yeah. diet for health and, and, and potentially mental health uh, issues for, for, for a number of years now. And so, and for those that don't know who you are, can you give us a little quick, just a quick rundown of your background for, for, for our listeners? Sure. sure. Uh, I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and uh, I'm one of the co-authors on uh, carbohydrate restriction as the first approach to uh, diabetes with uh, Dr. Feynman. Um, so, and I've had a personal interest, very personal interest in, uh, metabolism because I think it has a lot to do with mental health. In fact, it's really interesting that, uh, in the Northern regions before our foods reached the far North where they had more of a carnivore diet, um, they didn't have mental health problems. So I really think that there is something here. I don't know where it is, but I'm looking, um, I also have uh, diabetes, but I have been uh, keto for probably about 12 years. So I managed to keep it in check and I feel like I have more energy than I had when I was in my 20s. So I wanna share that with my patients. I really want to help them out. So I usually try to get them at least paleo, but probably low carb, high fat paleo, at least dialing back to where we were back in the 70s when things were not so grim. And um, and I'm a big advocate for a nutrient-dense diet, whatever that is. Again, I don't think I know what that is, but I try to get as close as I can. Yeah, I think that's a good general strategy for, for, for most people. And it's interesting. Did you, I can't remember if you said, did you have some issue with like Ehlers Nanolis or something like that? As I well? do. That, okay. Oh yeah, I have all of the flexibility. Yeah, I see that. You're showing off your finger flexibility. <laughs> yeah, right. I can do know. tricks. Yeah, for those who don't know, ehlers Danlos is a type of connective tissue disorder, which um, a lot of time results in hyperlaxity, and uh, people yeah. sometimes will have uh, joint dislocations and subluxations kind of spontaneously, and it can be very uh, okay. debilitating. And it's kind of interesting, just as an aside, there's another physician on Twitter who goes by Jane Doe, so I don't know what her real name is, but she's up in, uh, I think, the Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken. She's an ER physician who also has, you know, ehlers Danlos, And mm-hmm. uh, she's been on a carnivore diet, and, and goodness, she says she hasn't had sub- subluxation yep. in, 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 like, in months and months and months, and she used to have them pretty regularly, now she's back to working out. So I think that's it's very yeah. interesting that even with a yes. genetic disease like that, there are dietary things that, that can impact that. And it makes sense that, w- that it would. But, uh, and actually... A lot of the features of ehlers danlos do look like nutritional deficiencies. Yeah, I mean, you could see with, you know, you could see with like, you know, vitamin C deficiency, scurvy, where, yes. you, have, where you have collagen disorder. So that's, right. that's uh, yeah. very fascinating to see yeah. that. So, that didn't even cross my mind that if you, would, if you have that and you'd go into the weight room and you know, you'd probably way more susceptible for something to go wrong. And you certainly wouldn't want Absolutely. to be blowing up a bunch of weight and being underneath it in a situation like that. Absolutely. And then the other part of this too, is I have a widened aortic bulb. Yeah. You don't want to pressure that you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, weightlifting has to be taken, uh, taken with advisement. Let's put it that way. You really have to. I I used to treat patients that, I mean, they would literally dislocate something in their body like two or three times a week. I mean, it's, it's just a very, I mean, I can't imagine it's very frustrating, uh, Thing to live up so but so so you you work with uh you said was it uh who was it you wrote the, you co-authored the paper with again i'm sorry that who was with 
uh, Dr. Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, yeah, right. So he's big in that. And so what, you know, as a psychiatrist, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, and it's in me, me as an orthopedic surgeon, we don't really consider diabetes typically our purview. I mean, it, obviously, we have a lot of patients that have that, but that's not really our primary yeah. focus. And so what led you to want to publish literature on this sort of stuff coming from, from the field of psychiatry? Were you interested in, um, were, were you seeing it impact your, your patient's mental health? Well, I even saw it impact my mental health. Um, well, with, uh, you can probably see the shake in my head. I have dystonia. I have a couple of like neurological problems, right? Um, and actually, an ADHD is one of them. And with ADHD often comes uh, mood swings and frustrations, not being able to concentrate. And I have to say, I finally went off of the ADHD drugs, and I will not call myself the most organized crayon in the box, but I can tell you that um, it's gotten a lot better. My concentration is a lot better. I do support it a lot with uh, technology, which I'm grateful for. But I can tell you that uh, my very low carbohydrate diet helps me out in most cases. And so I got to thinking about it and I thought, well, I'm an N equals one, but common things happen commonly, right? So what if I experiment a little bit with my patients? This was uh, years ago. And I thought the best, the best uh, group to do that with, I was working at the county at the time, was with these severely mentally ill people who are on met metabolism disrupting medications like the atypical antipsychotics. And what I found is not only did they need less dosing, at least from what I could see, and again, this is just me observing, this is not a study, but from what I could see, they seemed to need lower doses and they were able to tolerate them better because their weight and their lipids were in much better shape. So that's when I started thinking, well, okay, what about hypoglycemia? And so, um, and I have a case to tell you about today, which is just stunning. Um, and I'm starting now, later in the years, I've been doing this for about oh, probably 12 years, maybe, paying attention to this, uh, in practice altogether, maybe 20. So um, what I'm seeing now is a lot of these, these people who have ups and downs during the day, who think that they're bipolar, a lot of them have reactive hypoglycemia. And, and that's really, it's amazing to see that. And also to be able to get them on a low carb, high fat diet and have things smooth out for them without medication. Yeah, I mean, we see uh, even people without clinical diagnosis of any sort of mental health thing, the diet will infect mood. You see it with kids. I mean, you load all the mm -hmm. sugar in there. They go oh, yeah. a few minutes and then they're pissed off for the next six hours or five <laughs> more yeah. sugar and so and they're hungry yeah they're hungry and it's not surprising at all this has an effect and so we've had you know folks like dr georgie eat on talking a little bit about the connection between uh, mental health and diet uh we've had a you know recently a guy named brett lloyd who had this tremendous story of you know long lifelong clinical depression where he basically i mean basically got rid of it got off all his medications and i mean it's it's, it's so mm -hmm. uh, heartwarming to hear stories like that but what do you think I mean, obviously, there are, it's, it's very, very complicated, and there's a lot of things going on, but what do you think the main drivers, and obviously not every, and you know, I've got a picture behind me, especially for the show of all the different yeah. mental health Anorexia, disorders that we, that we sometimes mm -hmm. consider, yeah. uh, what do you think some of the major common drivers are as it relates to lifestyle that we can impact? You know, obviously, we can't change our genetics, you know, I mean, uh, the right. epigenetic modification, but what do you think those drivers tend to be, and how can, how can diet and lifestyle affect those? Um, I, okay, so there was a time probably in the early 2000s when uh, people of Iceland were considered to be robust people because they would endure 24 hours of night and they wouldn't be depressed. But when the ultra processed foods and other foods um, from Western foods reached their shores, uh, there was a correlation made that the change in traditional diets was harming their mental health, but was harming their mental health at the same time as it was harming their physical health. So they, these same people that were having mental issues also were having heart disease, heart disease diabetes, um, 
all kinds of problems um, that we experience in the US. So, and then I also look at dogs. If you look at dogs versus wolves, dogs actually get periodontal disease within two years of life. Wolves do not get periodontal disease. They were also having dental problems that they had never had before. So I think all of these things came together and all of these things I think are part and parcel in large part due to our highly processed foods. I think we don't eat nutrient dense diets anymore. Now that's probably not true for everyone. There's probably some genetic component and a few other things. But I would say in my practice, where the bread and butter is in anxiety and depression, I see these things largely clear when people get on nutrient dense diets. And it's, I think it's no coincidence. Um, and in my practice, what I see is they need less medication or sometimes no medication. I'm also seeing people who are being called quote bipolar and their mood swings are happening all in the same day. They're not happening over periods of days or periods of weeks. They're having an up and a down all in the same day. And um, there's a test that, peop that people sometimes take, usually when they're trying to find out if they're uh, diabetic, called the oral glucose tolerance test with, ins or it's oral glucose tolerance test. I do mine with insulin, but OGTT is what it's, it's short uh, for that. And um, I found in a recent patient who was having, who was coming to me for bipolar disorder, um, she was having her mood swings during the day. Uh, it was interrupting her family life because they would be so extreme. And uh, she was bracing herself to be on medication. I, I did an OGTT on her and her second hour glucose was, are you ready for it? 21. <laughs> That's pretty low. All right. And I said, well, what did you do in the second hour? And she said, I felt sleepy. And so I took a nap in my car. And I, I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> she could have had a seizure, you know. So, uh, so she was way low. And by the way, the lab, it's really kind of amusing, but not that the lab called me at 10 o'clock last night, 12 hours after they, after they had drawn it saying that she had a critical result. I called her this morning, she was fine, walking, talking. But she was relieved to find out that her symptoms were probably due to extremely, uh, extreme uh, reactive hypoglycemia or reactive low blood sugar to her meals. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that is a little scary. They call you 12 hours after somebody's over 21. You know, it's like, well, they're... <laughs> I know, right? Either, either <laughs> dead or seized or something like that. But yeah, uh, lucky for her, that didn't it didn't result in anything worse. But you know, it's something you know, because you kind of touched on, you know, you know, the, basically what people consider seasonal affective disorder, where people spend a lot of time up in the dark. And my dad will be happy that I mentioned this. He, there's a book written by Robert Marshall in the 1930s or so called Arctic Village, and this was takes place up in uh, north of the Arctic, Arctic Circle, up in Alaska. I can't remember the name of the town. It starts with a W, but I'm blanking on the name right now. But it was, you know, it was basically a group of people that were, you know, a lot of native Inuit and and in some of the Western or, you know, the, the Caucasians that had lived with them. And, you know, he, he was a noted guy that traveled around the world. He said, these are the happiest people he'd ever met in his life. And, you know, above the right. people, they're spending six <laughs> months out of the year, you know, three months out of the year, where it's very, very dark. And so they weren't affected by seasonal affective disorder. And they were living off the land and, you know, what's up there, largely they're eating a lot of caribou and, you know, yeah. you know, probably some berries and stuff like that. But right. basically they were the happiest people he'd ever met and they're up in the dark all the time. So, yeah, I would not doubt that, uh, you know, our changing diet has just wrecked damn near everything. And it's kind of sad to see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this, this uh, notion about blood sugar swings, uh, affecting our mood stability. I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, we have so many, uh, uh, you know, electrolyte dependent, uh, you know, uh, voltage gated uh, transport things that happen yeah. throughout our nervous system. That, it's delicate. You know, we have yes. concentration of these things. These things are going to be going off all the time. I can't imagine. It yes. doesn't do that, particularly with mood instability. And so one of the things and, and, this, and this is something I'd really like to see because, you, you know, when you mention the fact that you're checking, you know, oral glucose tolerance tests and you're coupling insulin to that because that's kind of mirror some of the work that Joseph Kraft was doing. I'd be interested yeah. to see what impact that has on or, or if you're noticing any trend, trends 
in different mental health disorders with, with how they respond with their insulin response, as well as their glucose response. Yeah, I had a, a gentleman who I did the OGTT insulin with. I don't have his uh, numbers in front of me, but his, um, his, if you look just at the OGTT, and this is a guy who weighed well over 300 pounds. Um, if you look just at the OGTT, you would think, and, and you cut it off at the two hour mark, which is where it usually, that he had a totally normal uh, trajectory in terms of glucose. And so job done, move on, right? But I thought this guy is having these terrible mood swings. He's having a lot of anxiety. He's having a lot of depression. He's hungry all the time. Something is going on here. So I get, I put, before I do the OGTT insulin, I generally put a free of charge, folks, I don't charge anybody for this because it's my way of gathering information and it's not really psychiatric, but I just basically put a Abbott Freestyle Libre Pro uh, continuous glucose monitor on these people. And I noticed that he was sinking into hypoglycemia fairly regularly. And he seemed to be symptomatic. I also have to ask about symptoms because sometimes these monitors aren't exactly right. So, but he was symptomatic. So I went ahead and like I said, the OGTT was fine. But when you got the insulin, the insulin rose well above his glucose. His highest glucose was 143, but his insulin rose up toward about, it was around 250. Okay, and then hours after his meal, he'd sink into uh, depression and anxiety. So now he's lost, I think he's well below the 300 mark now, and it's just been since October. So he's pretty happy with the way things are going, uh, and his mood did get better. And so, and on a ketogenic diet, by the way. Yeah. yeah, that was that was going to be my, a question I had for you. Just your thoughts on this, because like when I think of just how readily we kind of prescribe medication and kind of take that mm-hmm. route with folks, like the kind of curious slash um, conspiracy side of me wants to think like, here we have these companies that are making billions of dollars selling prescriptions and this and that and the other thing. So right. it's just, being readily prescribed because they're kind of pulling the strings, so to speak from behind. But then the more skeptical side of me from like the, just like, okay, let's, let's think about this from another angle also thinks, well, maybe some of this stuff is getting prescribed on a such a readily basis because there's very little faith by the practitioner that one of their clients is actually going to go and put into practice the nutritional protocol that would maybe yeah. eliminate or minimize the need for these medications. Do you see like, one, both, or like a combination of those things happening a lot? Or what are your thoughts there? I don't know if I'm just kind of in a sweet spot countrywide, because Oregon is a little different. Anybody who's watched Portlandia, they know that people around here want to know the pedigree of the chicken they're eating. Um, So I may have a more receptive audience, but in in my experience, I do get cooperation and the way that I do it and I can't say every patient cooperates but enough do that they actually get better and they can feel the difference when they slide off the path Um, so for example I will get people to cooperate with my way of eating the first thing I do is just say no sugars no grains let's just get rid of those right now anything powdered is no longer food and so let's get rid of uh, the acellular carbohydrates, the flours, the grains, the sugars. And I show them uh, using David Unwin's charts. You've probably seen it on phcuk.org. He has uh, sugar equivalent charts. And it's a really nice graphic. And it shows them how much sugar is actually coursing through their system. And they, by and by, they start feeling better. They aren't going deep keto, so they're not getting keto flu. They're just getting rid of some of the biggest offenders. Um, and then they'll trip and fall. They'll do fine for months. And then they'll come to me and they'll go, Dr. Childers, I feel worse. The depression is coming back. I've got anxiety. What do I do? And some of these people are quite ill. Some of these people do have severe bipolar one, things like this. And I'll say, okay, can you hang on for one week? Go back to the way you were eating for a week 
and let's get together and see if we need to change your, change your medications after that. And they come back to me, they're sheepish. Uh, Dr. Childers, I feel better. Uh, <laughs> I had one woman at uh, Christmas time. Okay, the eating, the eating holidays from uh, Halloween through Christmas. OMG, this is when people really fall off the rails. And uh, they'll come to me and they'll say, I ate the Christmas cookies and then I became, I, I, I kid you not, suicidal. They wow. feel that bad. It throws them into the state that they were so used to before they started feeling better. So, and it's more crushing then. So they learn. They learn from that. And that usually helps them stay on track. That's really interesting. And I think one thing that I've learned from, I guess, interviewing some folks who are working with, uh, with, with uh, patients using a, a ketogenic or high-fat, low-carb diet mm -hmm. for therapeutic reasons was that um, my, my, I guess my, my mistaken assumption before all that was that these folks are the ones that absolutely need to be like the 30 to 50 grams a day, full stop. And uh, a lot of uh, the, these practitioners have been saying, no, it's, it's not quite that strict. I think there's some folks that maybe need to do that, but there's also a population that they're, they're being a little more generous. And there's, there's certainly low carb, very much so compared to the average American, but not necessarily like zero carb. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Do you have like specific ranges that you're usually targeting once they maybe get past that? Step? Yeah, I have, I, I do have ranges, but it's according to what the person wants and what they're willing to, you've probably heard of motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to meet them where they're at because some of this is so new to them. I have people who are raised on pop tarts and Cheerios. Mm -hmm. Actually, now that I think about it, I was raised on pop tarts. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, so I'm just saying that there are some people for whom uh, nutrition never really entered their minds as being a factor in this. So I might be lucky to just get them off of cereal <laughs> and, and get them onto something like uh, muffin frittatas. Those are my favorite go-to snacks because they're like little handfuls of eggs and bacon and you can take them with you, you can rush out the door with them. I make it as easy for them to comply as, as humanly possible. And then uh, the other thing I take into account, there's a really amazing, amazing survey of uh, parents of autistic children. I think autistic children are the canaries in the coal mine. And what they found in those surveys is that the drugs, get this, the antifungals improved behavior in autistics. Let that sink in, antifungals, all right? Uh, the other most helpful drug out of all the drugs that parents said they tried was Risperdal, but it has um, marked side effects. But if you go into the non-drug area of what works for them, the gluten-free, casein-free diet works for them, are we not doing that with keto, right? Uh, a lot of times uh, people go completely off dairy when they do keto. Um, Gluten-free, casein-free diet, specific carbohydrate diet, and um, fine gold diet. Those were some of the most effective diets and they actually made a difference. And when they put in Honolulu, when they put kids, um, it was University Hawaii Manoa, they put kids on a ketogenic diet they started becoming more aware of their surroundings. These were autistic children that had lots of behavior problems and uh, they started having more quote, good days. So I think that what I try to do is eliminate those things that are probably gonna aggravate things. So if they go paleo, they get rid of gluten, they get rid of casein, and then they can delicately add those things back if they dare. They usually feel so much better they don't want to, but when they do, they get to find out how that feels. And so we give them some idea of how their bodies are, are working. Some people, I can get them to go uh, keto breakfast, keto lunch, but they refuse to give up uh, carbohydrates for their dinner. Fine, I mean, two out of three isn't bad. Um, I've got other people who are on uh, paleo keto or primal keto, primal meaning at that you add in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, high fat dairy. 
fine. They're still eating a whole lot better than when they were on the standard American diet, AKA SAD for a reason. Uh, and, they're, and they're also getting rid of, with, with paleo, I think an added benefit is getting rid of the chemicals like car carrageenan and uh, gums and all kinds of things that can uh, disrupt the digestive system. So I think, so that's what I aim for. And I just try to get them to do what they're willing to do when they're willing to do it. Hey, I, I will tell you, even my very, very best friend, whom I love dearly, and I've had breakfast with her for the last 10 years, I must not be a very good salesperson with my friends because she only just started going keto and she actually canceled her second back surgery because her pain was so much better. Yeah, I mean, and that's experience. It. That, that, uh, that is experience, you know, particularly with the arthritic and joint pain. I saw that all the yeah. time. I think that's pretty remarkable. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are very critical about people that will suggest that, that mental health disorders can be, dare I say, even cured uh, with significant dietary changes. I mean, do you, I mean, there, you know, people talk about diabetes. Well, you didn't cure it because you can't eat, you, you can't go back to eating garbage. <laughs> <laughs> do you find that, um, do you find that, uh, that some mental health disorders, whether it's depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. can be completely asymptomatic based on dietary changes enough to, you know, and, and I don't know when, when we, when we talk about a cure, I mean, it okay. becomes semantics at that point in my view, but what are your thoughts on people say there's no way that diet can 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 cure these diseases? They're 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 so complicated, and there's so many factors that go into that. Do you do you have do you agree with that or disagree with that? Or what are your thoughts? Well, if the current way of eating is why they are where they're at, such as in uh, my patient who had a, a blood glucose of 21, then diet is the cure for sure. All right. Um, obviously that pattern, that daily pattern of mood swings is not bipolar disorder. So I think what I think is that we have at the very least, a lot of misdiagnoses, a lot of misdiagnoses and these people fritter along, they do the best they can. For example, I had a gentleman come into me to see me saying he thought he had depression because he had brain fog. He had such high hyperglycemia that my uh, freestyle Libre Pro could not measure it. It went right off the graph. So I talked to him uh, about lowering his carbohydrates in the next week. I guess you could call it a cure because he said, thanks doc, I don't have the brain fog anymore. I have a lot more energy. Appreciate your help, uh, adios, right? So, so that's, so there are a lot of people like that, I think, that are getting medications when really the metabolism is, um, is not right. And there are also people for whom medications probably aren't going to work very well, even if they need them, because they have this underlying problem. That's really interesting, too, because I know just within the kind of ketogenic community, that's one of the things that you hear people saying a lot is like, they feel like their mental clarity or their brain fog is gone. So you just wonder how many people were like walking around in a situation like that, that guy you mentioned and just didn't know because they'd never had the opportunity or took the time to actually test those numbers and find out that it was a nutritional thing. Exactly. Exactly. And um, just think he walked away without any psychiatric medications whatsoever. And the cure took place in two weeks. Now I haven't followed up with him, but I just assume, I guess, maybe incorrectly, I don't know, that no news is good news. He hasn't come back. I don't think he, I think he liked our services. I think he probably would come back. But I have, uh, quote, lost uh, patients to their health. Yeah, well, which is why I think we have a lot of turnover in our in our building. Uh, people don't seem to need me for very long uh, before they're seen like every couple months or something like that, depending mm -hmm. on what the situation is. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting. I'm sure you kind of have thought this way in the past too, with your background in psychology. It's kind of twofold. Like you send a patient out with a dietary approach that returns them to quote unquote normal status. Mm -hmm. They're walking out 
not thinking I have, there's, there's something wrong with me. So they're walking out without this stigma attached to them mm -hmm. of like, that's going to be very different where you walk in and you have some brain fog that you think is attached to depression and you get prescribed medication. You walk out of that facility thinking I'm broken. You know, yes. this is something, this is, there's a stigma on me now as a depressed person, you know, I'm not normal. I'm not, something's wrong with me. And then they walk out with a dietary fix. They're like, Oh, okay. I was just doing some, I was mistaken before. Now I know. And I think that's a lot different from a psychological standpoint. It is. And, but the thing of it is, uh, think of the market that's out there for this kind of approach because everybody's eating the standard American diet, the my plate, right? And a very interesting, uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill looked at the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the most recent one, and they determined that uh, the uh, percentage of adults that is metabolically healthy in the United States is, are you ready for this, 12%. Oof. <laughs> 12. Yeah, we saw, yeah, we saw that data come out a couple months ago. It was pretty shocking to see that. It's I mean, we are, we, are, we are literally just a walking bunch of disabled, dysfunctional, diseased people, and we've got to do better. Mm -hmm. Hey, and when you talk about it, because I, I know you talk about nutrient density as being a factor and I want to, I want to just, are you seeing, I mean, are you testing patients for nutrient deficiencies when they come in? Are you seeing anything some. like that? Maybe, maybe yeah. deficiencies. Limited. I mean, there's a lot of things that are, that are mm. postulated as potentially contributing to mental health disorders, but yes. I want to talk to you about, you know, I'll show you my, I'll, show, I'll, I'll reveal my bias here. Obviously, you know, I think I'm a big fan of meat, but we see okay. that there have been some studies out there that are correlating, you know, meat-free diets, either vegetarian, vegan diets with a higher incidence of mental health disorders. And we don't know if that's, yes you know, because of the diet or, or the people that, that have those in the head of time, select those diets, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's causation or, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg type of thing, mm -hmm. or the, I should say the, the tofu or the, well, whatever the equivalent of tofu is a soybean. But um, do we, uh, do you see in clinical practice that bearing out? Are you seeing that, that, that people that are pursuing plant-based diets have any increased incidence in, in mental health issues? Or are you seeing, I mean, because we have such a poor diet overall. I mean, the standard American diet is such garbage and, and low in deficiency that we can't, yes. we can't sort that out. I, I mean, where, what does your clinical experience show with regard to some of that stuff that's out there? Well, uh, on weekends, I actually round at a psychiatric hospital. And uh, one of the things that I, that I noticed right away, because I would ask these questions, um, is that at least to my eye, again, this is not a formal study, but from what I could tell, there were two groups in the hospital that were over overrepresented. Uh, one group was gastric bypass, and the other group uh, was either vegetarian or especially vegan. All right, so I, I'll tell you why I think this is going on. Um, one of the things that we know from past literature is that uh, B12 appears to be uh, a deficiency in B12 appears to be associated with uh, psychiatric problems. Um, also folate, which by the way is very rich in the liver, uh, folate deficiencies. And I'm, I'm seeing that and that's really strange to me to see those, especially folate because folate's so, uh, so throughout uh, the diet that we have as poor as it may be. Um, and then, and it's also enriched in flowers and things like that. So I didn't expect that. And then the other thing is that um, iron deficiency. And iron deficiency, well, first off, B12, meat, fish, eggs, poultry are the usual sources. The human body can make B12 out of those things. And uh, vegans definitely need to be, um, they need to be supplemented because they're not gonna get uh, the kind of B12 that they need uh, from plants. It's not gonna happen. But also iron. Iron is a really big deal. Um, okay, so when you give up red meat, you give up heme iron. Heme iron is the most easily available and easily absorbed source of iron, iron in the American diet. It, it just is. Um, clams and mussels are really good too. Uh, livers are really good, like chicken liver, if somebody doesn't want to eat, eat meat. But you really have to have some sorts of heme iron to catch up, especially women of reproductive age and young children. And here's, here's the scary part. 
young children between zero to three, if they do not achieve adequate iron status for growth and development, some of these children may end up mentally retarded for the rest of their lives. Let that sink in. That's a really, really big deal. Uh, in terms of adults, uh, iron is a limiting step for making serotonin and dopamine in the brain. So if your brain iron is deficient, you're probably not even going to benefit fully from any drugs that I give you. So, so those things have to be restored. And then iron, you can only take for a short time. It's, it's best to take it for a short time. There are some associations with uh, taking a lot of supplemental iron and possibly causing things like cancer or neurological problems. So once the person has taken their iron, then we, I have to go shoulder to shoulder with my patient and say, well, now where are you going to get your iron? Now that we've stopped the supplement, where will you get your iron? And then another area is the omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential for normal brain function. And it turns out that plant, uh, the plant omega-3s uh, such as ALA do not convert in any great degree to DHA and EPA, which is what you need. And DHA and EPA is most likely going to be found in animals. They say fish, but if you eat grass-fed beef, you're gonna get a good, uh, a very good ratio uh, of um, EPA, DHA, and other uh, essential acids. But uh, a lot of us don't have access to that. That's, it's a problem. I, I actually try to get the fattiest grass-fed beef I can get but um, people are a little afraid of fat too. So I think all of these things are impacting people who go vegetarian or vegan. Yeah, we had, uh, we had Joel Salatin on yesterday and uh, you know, I, I, was, I was pleased to see that he lets his animals run out to about 32 months. So I imagine I'll put a little more fat on them. But, uh, and that's the thing. I think that uh, we've been so brainwashed to think that we need to eat low fat meat. And so that the, the, the entire beef industry is kind of backed off from the amount of fat they put on the animals. And so they, they kind of sort of preferentially produce these animals that are a little leaner uh, for, the, for general consumption for most of the people. And, and I think that, uh, you know, if you look at pictures from, of cuts of meat from the 1930s and 40s, yeah. I mean, they had a lot of fat on them. They look good. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think fat's where it's at for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, another topic that I've seen you, you discuss from time to time is sleep apnea and, and yeah. how do you see that playing out as a problem, you know, or does it impact mental health? I imagine it does, but I mean, can we oh, talk yes. a little bit about uh, the, the yes. etiology of sleep apnea and, and do you treat sleep apnea? I mean, I don't, I don't know that you're a sleep specialist, but I mean, do you see that as part of your practice or do you, do you attempt to treat it at all? I'm a member of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and I joined specifically so I could find out what to ask my patients and when I'm out of my depth. Right. And as soon as I have a patient that I suspect of sleep apnea, I send them to a formal lab. A lot of them will end up with a take home test and some of them will pass it, but it doesn't mean they don't have sleep apnea. In fact, the next step is to actually have an in-lab test. That is what's going to tell you whether you have it or not. It's called a polysomnogram. Um, if someone has sleep apnea, they are periodically, hour by hour, losing oxygen overnight. And the brain is not gonna be happy with that, all right? But neither is, the brain and the body are connected. It's a pretty amazing concept, but it's true. And uh, so, and this is something I try to remind people because I'm a psychiatrist, but actually the brain is seated in the body. So um, what happens is the stress that the brain feels is also stress that the heart feels. And over decades, it can lead to heart failure, pulmonary high blood pressure in the lungs called pulmonary uh, high, hypertension. Uh, it can lead to all kinds of problems. In the short term, what it does is gives people unrestful sleep. And sleep is some of the most healing time of your day. It really has to be prioritized and maximized. And yet most Americans don't get 
uh, enough sleep. They really don't get enough sleep or they don't get refreshing sleep. When someone is snoring, and they don't have to snore to have sleep apnea because they're different kinds, but if someone is snoring and it's pretty clear that they are holding their breath several times an hour, that needs to be reversed because that stress puts the body into fight or flight. Uh, there are two, two kind of autonomic nervous system general categories, fight or flight, rest and digest. It's better for us to be in rest and digest than in fight or flight, uh, unless it's necessary. It's good to have alarm bells when you need them, but most of us don't need them 24 seven. So uh, that wears on the body and it becomes anxiety. And so a lot of these people that I'm treating for anxiety actually do have sleep apnea. If that is not corrected, they will always have this high uh, sympathetic activity, fight or flight activity. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting uh, acronym or survey called Stop Bang. I don't know if you're you're, you're familiar with the Stop I'm Bang. Not, or, no. So it, it's basically just a, a screening tool that, that people use. And I, I used to be married to an anesthesiologist, and she was always dealing with sleep apnea because it impacted their innovations. And so the thing it's it, it Stop Bang stands for snoring, uh, tiredness, observed apnea. Mm -hmm. um, the P stands for uh, blood pressure and then uh, mm -hmm. his body mass pressure. index, age, neck circumference, and gender. So big fat guys with a big neck that are tired and snore, you mm -hmm. know, basically, and have high, you know, high blood pressure are, are prime candidates for sleep apnea. So if you're one of those guys, and I, you know, quite honestly, I probably had it in my early to mid forties before I made the dietary changes because I yes. know I was tired. I was snoring, you know, and, you know, and, and my blood pressure was going up and, Mm -hmm. Big guy anyway, so I had a pretty damn big neck. And uh, so, I mean, fixing my diet, fixed all that stuff. And so it's good to see, and, and it's good, good to see that we can do that. And are you seeing that uh, diet alone can fix sleep apnea? Have you ever seen that happen? Yeah, with weight loss. But I will tell you, I have sleep apnea, and I don't look like someone who should have it. I've been on a CPAP for a year. It's reversed everything that I was going through. I was bone tired thinking about retiring from psychiatry, and I love psychiatry. And uh, now I feel like I have better energy than I, than I can remember. So it's crazy. But the other thing that sleep apnea does, we're talking about things like keto and we're talking about diets, is it causes metabolic problems. It's almost as if you're taking an atypical antipsychotic. It's just wrecking the metabolism. It causes weight gain and then it becomes a vicious cycle. The more sleep apnea you have, the more weight gain, and it just goes around and around. Um, so it does affect metabolism. I do not know what the mechanism is, uh, but people I've seen people on CPAP lose weight. I had a, a lady actually leave my practice because she said, I got everything I want. I don't have depression anymore. I don't have anxiety, and I'm losing weight. <laughs> So, uh, so it can be profound and it often happens in skinny people because what happens is some people just have a narrow airway. I'm one of these people. I have a very small jaw, very narrow airway. So it can happen to anyone. And I think it's, it's largely under diagnosed in women. Uh, it's an, there's an estimated, and this may be uh, a little bit generous, but uh, in terms of more, uh, but it, maybe one in six women and one in three men as adults with uh, the trend being uh, toward the older part of the spectrum might be about right. Yeah, I wonder if your, your, your Ellis Danlos contributes with that, with, with, the, with the yeah. tissue integrity. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. And there's probably, there's probably, yes. If we looked in the literature, probably, we'd probably find an association with sleep, after, sleep apnea and ED. So, I mean, that's interesting. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to ButcherBox.com and place your first order. 
Now back to the show. Let me let me di- uh, just digress into another topic because it's become popular, uh, for good or bad, and, and many people think good that people are, are returning to uh, medical marijuana for a host of other things, whether it's chronic pain or chronic inflammation. Uh-huh. Some people are, compl- are are reporting, you know, pretty good success with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you, I know you've sort of, I've seen you battle back and forth with some people that are very pro and you said, well, wait a minute, there may be some issues with, with telling everybody to go, you know, go, go start loading up on CBD oil and, and marijuana and stuff like that. So what do you, what are the potential downsides of that? And, and, uh, you know, like I said, I don't have a lot of, I don't have any experience with that personally. And I don't have a lot of, I just haven't pursued that. I know some people that follow me on the diet, ask me about that. And I really tell them, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, I I think the inflammatory aspect, maybe that's better served by just fixing your diet perhaps, but what are your, what are, what are, what are reasons you might hesitate to, to embrace uh, widespread use of, of medical marijuana? Okay. So medical marijuana is really largely, once the doctor gives someone a marijuana card, uh, the marijuana is now pretty much out of their hands. If I give someone, let's say, uh, Ritalin, okay, I can check them and I can monitor and I can make sure they're getting the right dose. If I give someone uh, in a state where marijuana is not legal a medical marijuana card, uh, they don't have to ever come back. So I never find out how they're doing. And one of the problems that I've seen is that uh, kids, especially kids, kids who, who dive in deep and young, and a lot of times it's, it's legal in our state. So parents have it around. It's easy to get, it's easy to ask, access. And what we're finding is that for adolescents whose brains are still developing, and by the way, they, they develop until they're about 26 years of age. So there's a long period of development. Um, they can actually make some permanent changes to, uh, to their mental health and not in a good way. Uh, marijuana can cause depression just as it can ease depression. It can cause anxiety just as it seems to ease anxiety. And as kids are coming off of this medic medication, I guess, drug, as they're coming off this drug, that is when they're most likely to become agitated. So, so there's that group. And then if they smoke early, they're more likely to have a schizophrenic form or schizophrenic type uh, disorder in some groups, maybe by quite a lot, uh, by the time they're 26 years old. So since I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, yeah, I'm, I'm a little scared about this. And I have seen some psychotic breaks in heavy uh, marijuana users in young people. And um, boy, oh boy, you don't want to go there. You really don't. It's a heartbreak. Then the other thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Amen. Dan Amen and I actually, when I was in the Air Force, (laughs) he and I graduated from the same child and adolescent program a few years apart, but he has his very own spec scan. How fun is that? So he's been doing a lot of um, spec images of persons who delve into marijuana. Marijuana, the THC is fat soluble and the brain is fat, 65% or so. Um, And he's showing that the frontal lobes, which are the seat of civilization, planning, organization, look very much like someone who has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I'm also concerned about that. You know, I think... Yeah, I, I just think that we we see the promise of of cannabis, but we don't take into account that every drug has its risks sometimes. So all I am is is just sounding not an alarm, like don't ever smoke this stuff, but I'm just saying um, we have to use more caution uh, because it's not been well studied. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, two two points I think are, are very. Uh, things I'd like to, to, to just kind of circle back to and highlight. Uh, mm-hmm. One, you said that the human brain is still developing till age 26, which I think many people would find shocking. You know, most of us, we see most of our brain development takes place, you know, first few years of life, you know, particularly up to by, by age five or six. Uh, but the fact that it's still de- developing to age 26, and then we see a lot of people, particularly young people adopting 
you know, vegan and vegetarian diets when they're young, yeah. you know, maybe that has a negative conflict. Maybe it has a negative uh, component to, to brain development long term, and that and that's likely going to be a permanent issue. And then uh, the other thing you talked about was, you know, the fact that you know while THC or other components in cannabis might have a beneficial role, there's also potential for for a negative role. I think that's the, one of the things we see with plant compounds in general is that many times the perceived benefits that we see are because they may upregulate our defense systems. You know, they may have a hormetic effect. They stimulate upregulation of some of the cytochrome P450 enzymes, you know, maybe the NRF2 enzymes. And they're, they're actually all basically, you know, we don't have a really use for them for the most part. You know, all these polyphenols and things like that that we are told we have to eat lots of. Basically, their body you takes them, it, it tries to detoxify them. They're not well absorbed. It may have an upregulation of the detoxification center, so that may make us more hardier. But at the same time, it's going to have a potentially deleterious effect in other places where it may, may maybe there's other things that it may cause problems with thyroid, it may cause problems mm-hmm. with gut permeability, and so on and so forth. And so, or think, even tooth decay. <laughs> what's that? Or even tooth decay? Well, I mean, certainly we know that sugar with tooth decay is a, a well-known phenomenon. I, I just don't know why every dentist in the world isn't telling his patients don't stop eating sugar. I mean, I guess it would drive them out of business probably, but. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, uh, I don't think that's a hard to put together. And I think, you know, let's, let's transition to something because you, I've seen you and I think it's you, I think you said something like stone age body, space age mind is a, something you've been talking space about. Let's, let's talk, diet. Yeah. Space age diet. Yeah. Let's, mm-hmm. let's talk about, let's talk about that a little bit just to, just to kind of, uh, you know, maybe you can, we can flesh that out a little better. Okay. So, um, Agriculture was was uh, quite the human experience, and um, <clears throat> and basically it worked out. I think for a lot of civilizations like Egypt, uh, yeah, they had tooth decay, but they had granaries that got them through uh, famines, and they were able to settle in one place. So I think agriculture basically stopped the hunter gatherer lifestyle for a lot of cultures, and there may have been some benefit to that. Um, but what it also did was bring in some foods that uh, humans hadn't experienced for millions of years, like powdered grains, things like this. Um, so basically what we have, we have not changed that much. Yes, some of us have enzymes to break down things like um, dairy or, you know, that persist throughout our lives. I mean, there have been some minor modifications but the basics are still there. We still can't really get away with eating sugar and starch without brushing and flossing. And even then there may be a time in our lives where time's up and now you have profound uh, uh, periodontal disease. There's nothing you can do about it. But it's these brand new foods that have been introduced only in the last like 15 to 20,000 years that are right now striping our health because we've taken it to a higher level. We've basically turned it into a drug. Um, We have departed these things uh, so far from where they came from, they're unrecognizable. You wouldn't know if you had never seen it before. You wouldn't know that a bag of white flour actually came from wheat. I mean, it's just um, crazy what we've done to food. So, So this is kind of an experiment, even things like broccoli, broccoli, which we just kind of take for granted, right? Um, the cruciferous vegetables, which by the way, in animals are goitrogens, they cause goiter. I've often wondered about this because I wonder how, how robust our iodine intake is now. That's, that's a story for another time. But broccoli, th- that's probably maybe 1,200 to 2,000 years old. It's new. It's very new. It came from mustard plant. So yeah, bro- yeah. Uh, there are a lot of things we take for granted today that never existed. Yeah, broccoli. Uh, broccoli came to the United States in 1920, and it was in. I got to got to England in the 1800s, and it was kind of. I think initially it was in Italy, I think, and and so yeah, it's a it's a relatively new thing. So the fact that people think we all need to be out eating broccoli, it's a new, it's a brand new food. I mean, we. Yeah, really it's, a, it's a new food. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, yeah. I don't think it tastes very good, but I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's my personal, uh, personal thing. You know, some interesting things about you know human brain develop. We look back evolutionary, and again, this this. This presumes you believe in the theory of evolution. There's, there's many people out there that don't. But I mean, if we look at like uh, Homo erectus mm-hmm. uh, from brain development stand, they, they started out around 800 cc's and they got all the way up to about 1200 cc's in their 1.8 million years on the earth. And so that was, we think, largely because they figured out how to hunt and particularly how to hunt these big 
giant megafaunal animals like elephants and and, yeah. and they they were able to fuel that brain growth and, yeah. and, and they brought their brain size up to about 1200 cc's by the mm -hmm. end and that's not much different than what we have today i mean average human brain size is around 1300 cc's so they got pretty close to us just by learning how to hunt and going from that small 800 cc brain and then even neanderthal had bigger brains than we did and most people don't mm -hmm. realize that a neanderthal brain i think average something like 1500 cc's um and, and then you know and, and even humans prior to agriculture had bigger brains than we do now. And then when we, went, we switched over the, yeah. the more plant-based agricultural diet, our brain actually shrunk by about 200 cc's. And so uh, we, uh, you know, we've gone backwards and some people face, think it has to do with greater, you know, neuralization. And I don't, I don't buy that because I don't think we switch species. I think we're still the same damn species that we were when we were Cro-Magna and <laughs> our brains just got smaller. And just because, you know, the thought is, why would a more intelligent animal die off? I, you know, like mm -hmm. Neanderthal, I think it's got outcompeted. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, probably cockroaches are out, will outsurvive us. It doesn't mean cockroaches are more intelligent than humans. Mm -hmm. but it's just well, I'm part Neanderthal, so I may have just absorbed it. Say that again. <laughs> I said, I'm part Neanderthal. I'm part Neanderthal. Do you believe? Yeah, we all, we, we pretty much all are, all right. of us are, for the most part, with the exception okay. of people that, that are, uh, purely of African ancestry, where where we and, and maybe even some yeah. of them might have some some Neanderthal, but but so we may have absorbed also that may have been we may not have only outcompeted but also absorbed. Yeah, no, I think we mated with them and and we we clearly did. So I mean that that may be yeah exactly. There may have been less of them and more of us, and we just we just sort of bred over you know mm -hmm. twenty or thirty generations until we had we were we were basically Homo sapien Neanderthal hybrids or whatever Homo sapiens were before. It's all still pretty murky. Uh -huh. yeah um, but but that stuff is is fascinating to me particularly uh uh some of the brain evolution stuff so it's uh mm -hmm. interesting uh as you know i'm a person who eats a lot of meat yep. car carnivore diet proponent yeah. and you know most people think i'm crazy but uh uh it's interesting I, and and if one of the one of the major things that i see of benefit of the things that i see often improved is our uh -huh. psychiatric type issues mood in particular and a lot of people yeah. are saying that they're Anxiety's gone away. Their depression's gone away. They're they're off their meds, and I think that's just wonderful. That's right. Um, have you had any experience with any of your patients going carnivore yet? I'm just wondering how how prevalent this is getting out. Of. Not yet, huh? Not they, yet. And I'm kind of say. waiting to see what happens because this is very new. Uh, eating all muscle meat. When I look at all of the different societies throughout the world, even the most carnivorous ones, they're eating awful. So, well, I mean, I don't, yeah. and, and I think this is a mis 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 mischaracterization of what I've been saying. I don't, ah. I don't necessarily know that eating all muscle meat is the way to do it either. I think we don't know okay. on that, but I mean, certainly there are people that that eat other organs. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. the, the longest people that have done this particular diet don't tend to eat muscle, don't tend to eat organs. But that's, you know, ah. again, that's that's just what we know about that. But. Uh, I mean, you can get a nutritionally complete and hit all your RDAs just eating an animal. And then, you know, if you eat enough liver, yes. enough seafood, you need enough, you know, if you include yes. dairy in there, it becomes particularly easy. And so yes. you don't need plants at all to, to have a nutritionally complete diet. That, I'm totally you know, on board with that, Sean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, totally uh, and that even that. presumes the RDA is accurate, which I don't think is accurate yeah. with regard to different diets because when you're when you're eating a standard diet you're eating a lot of anti-nutrients. I mean you're having a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of things, a lot of mm -hmm. compounds that chelate and bind uh minerals, calcium, magnesium, zinc, iron, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. copper probably. And so we have all these different requirements that, that go on. So I think it's it is really kind of untested water. I think hopefully you know the good thing about uh you know I think the good thing about veganism is there's people that are just willing to just eat meat just to protest yeah <laughs> i think we'll get some results and so i think uh we'll get some results out of that and see you know our human beings you know as i t i suspect and, and i suspect you possibly suspect more carnivorous than we thought we are maybe we're fact i think we are carnivores i'll just say it out yeah i think we're i, I think make that, no bones about it and yeah. i think i think people like amber o'hearn are throwing on the term facultative carnivore which basically means you know humans thrive on meat but we can handle some plants if we need to and plants are backup fuel and i think that to me that's i mean i think the i think the anthropological anthropologic evidence points that way and i think you know that, that, but we're never going to know because we can't go there and so the the other the, the, right. the question becomes well, let's just test it how do you test it? Do you have people eat, eat a bunch of meat and see what happens to them? And, and so far, the short-term experience has been extremely positive. So I think it's interesting. It's very interesting times. Do you have any concerns about um, 
you know, in med in medicine, you know, I, I'm, you know, I still get my CME stuff. I get stuff from Medscape and all of those sources sending me out all the, all those the hot topics. And it's all about plant-based this plant-based that, you know, right. it's being sort of generally adopted by the mainstream. Do you have any concerns about that particular um, phenomena? Big time, big time. If I was to make a new food pyramid, I would put meat, fish, eggs, poultry on the bottom. Yes, I, I think 55 to 60% of our, uh, of what we eat should be animal based, animal derived. And I get the, the concerns um, about the earth and all of this, but frankly, 30 million buffalo did not tear holes in the ozone and they were roaming on 12 feet of topsoil rich topsoil, it can be done. We just have to figure out how to do it. But I think if we keep going in this direction, we're all we're going to see is more disease, more disease susceptibility, and that includes not just the chronic non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, mental illness, I think is also uh, one of those, uh, but also uh, we're going to see scourges where we're not able to fight bacteria and we're not going to be able to fight a lot of things because we went in a more idealistic direction and not in a realistic direction for our bodies. Yes, I have very grave concerns about the future and I think we need to figure it out. Well, I think one of the biggest misconceptions with that is the fear mongering around how it's unsustainable to have a meat based diet across the world. I mean, I think like, gr granted, I, I would be shocked if we got to a point where everyone on the planet decided to eat only meat. Like <laughs> That would be about as surprising to me as everyone on the planet decided to eat a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. So the, we're, 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 we're in fairy tale land if we're going to this spot where it's like, okay, what do we do when you know, seven, eight billion people start only eating meats. Like that's just simply not going to happen. But uh, so to even argue about that, I think is kind of misguided. But, you know, we, we, as Sean said earlier, we just had Joel Saladin on the show and we've had Alan Saver on the show and they talk about some of this uh, yes. regenerative agriculture. Yes. And that's where I think a lot of the miscommunication or the, the, the deception becomes because, and I think most of it is like, ignorant deception in the sense that the person just doesn't really hasn't really looked at it enough to really know and they're just saying what they do know and it happens to be wrong but mm -hmm. um when joel was on he was telling us just like even with our current just the kind of deprived land we could we could we could meet demand in north america and that's not even taking into account the fact that if we switch to a holistic management process, right. the level of productivity and the number of animals we could actually sustain when that topsoil returns to what it was, you know, pre-industrial revolution, like it, it, it's, it's mind boggling how much. And then when you talk a couple that with the stacking method that he describes where you don't even need to block off, say like, uh, you know, five acres of land just for a ruminant to walk around and eat grass and then ultimately eat it. You can put that ruminant in the context of other things. Like if you can even have like a grape, grape vines over top of it, they, they, you can stack these things on top of one another, rotate them mm -hmm. and modern, simple modern technology, like movable electric fences. He described these, these little like uh, snout muzzles that you can put on sheep so they can, they can uh, prune or mow the ground, but they can't reach up and, you know, pull the grapevines off if you're going to do the yeah. stacking tech. So it's just brilliant. When you see him put that puzzle together, mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, we really did stray far away from this really finely tuned machine that the biological system yeah. had set up for us. And then we right. decided to think, we decided somewhere along the line that we know more than everything yes. or that we discovered everything. We know everything. We found everything out all the mm -hmm. science is settled. And, you know, here we are today, uh, finding out that just like the gut microbiome, you know, we, we decided from a manufacturer, from a, from a profit standpoint, cause we can sell you, you know, digestive enzymes, pre-digestive mm -hmm. enzymes, all this stuff that, you know, we figured this out too. When you ask the people who are really doing that, they'll willingly tell you, we know very little about the gut bacteria compared to what we don't know. 
same thing with like some, some of the soil biology. It's like the number of organisms and things that are working synergistically in there that we think we have kind of figured out. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's the same thing where we just don't know it yet. So right. we kind of have to let biology do its thing at least until we know we know, which mm-hmm. you make an argument that we probably never will, at least not, not in our lifetime. <laughs> yep. No, I, I hear you. And, and I've been actually studying these aspects. Um, I, I usually in my lectures, I, I hit on it very briefly. But I think there's just a lot we don't know. But that's really encouraging, those stats on being able to uh, provide meat. But I also want to mention that there are many cultures that eat insects. And there are all kinds of other ways of getting uh, animal-derived foods that we don't even think of. Uh, probably the cheapest one is just the humble egg. That egg has all the instructions and all of the nutrition to make a chick independent of the hen. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's incredibly valuable. And for low-income families, it could be just the best ever thing. So I, th- I think good things are coming. It's just, we have to be less squeamish about these things. Bring back sausages, we'll eat the awful, instead of sending it overseas to healthier cultures. Mm-hmm. Come on, people. Let's just make sausage. Really? <laughs> yeah, right? I, I think it, it is interesting when you look at the animal foods we have decided to focus on and eat, and it's very limited. Like most people yeah, are yeah. probably eating beef, chicken, salmon, mm-hmm. pork, and maybe some eggs, some dairy, that sort of stuff. But like mm-hmm. when you think of like wild game and, uh, you know, just uh, the amount of stuff that we could, especially if we want to start lo- working within a management side of things where we're trying to keep populations at a point where, they're mm-hmm. sustainable and not getting too big or too small. It's like there's not opportunity. Wild boar. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And then uh, um, to just not not to get too much into the Joel Salatin podcast, but the, the mm-hmm. interesting thing that he said too about that that was I found fascinating was we went we were looking at uh, the antibiotics that are used for cattle and kind of why we need that. Mm-hmm. And he was saying one of the interesting mechanisms that biology has done to kind of remedy that situation from a historical standpoint is when you have your ruminants out on pasture moving around, uh, Mm -hmm. birds are following them and picking out like a lot of the, you know, back or a lot of the bugs and things that are in the manure. And it's essentially purifying the manure. So you're not getting these situations where these ruminants walking through their own droppings are getting They're ending up with parasites and things like that because these birds are actually eating it. And then when you look at what a chicken's natural diet actually is, and you realize it's bugs, not grain, mm-hmm. which is another frustration of mine. I'll go to the grocery store and there'll be the expensive egg and I'll say 100% vegetarian fed. I'm like, well, I don't want that. Oh, yeah. Give me the 100% bug <laughs> fed chicken egg. <laughs> well, my understanding is that the humble chicken is the closest living relative to Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. So to make it even more humble, I think, is just a terrible thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know. And it's just like him describing how many of these like kind of pieces of the puzzles are part of this delicate balance. And you remove one of them, like you remove the bird from that system. Now all of a sudden you're dealing with, you know, bacteria infections with your cattle and stuff like that. Or it it seems like a simple little thing. But you know, you work these things all together. Now you have chickens, beef, eggs, and all these things kind of working in a a, a carbon neutral system and it's it's really fascinating to think of what we can do if we would you know all kind of focus our energies on that as opposed to you know arguing about you know this that and the other thing i guess <laughs> yeah we just have to figure it out but we can do it that's the thing yeah and i, I find it you know comforting to see more and more physicians uh willing to you know at least recognize the the, the, the importance of animal-based nutrition Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that we as a community of physicians and healthcare providers and, and, and just people in general need to organize better, need to come together, become more active because I think the other side, the folks that want us to eat, you know, plants and, and, and quite honestly, the more plants, the less we eat animal foods, the more processed foods we eat. That's just what happens historically. This will always happen. These uh, fake meat companies are lining up for it. They can't wait. They're licking their chops. You know, they can't wait to, to, to uh, you know, uh, Mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio, just announced that all 1,800 of their public schools are going meatless Monday. Yeah, I know. So they'll, be, they'll be undoubtedly replacing those options with things like Beyond Meat Burger, which is, you know, bamboo cellulose and canola oil oh. and 
just absolute garbage for the, what's that going to do to the gut yeah i don't know well we'll, we'll find out in about five years when we got a well, bunch of kids running around with adhd and behavior problems and bad grades wow. and all that stuff poor kids it's an experiment but i mean i think as physicians you know we need to be we just need to step up and say i mean most of us are meat eaters most of us recognize that you know we've let this small vocal minority of plant eaters and plant-based physicians uh run the run you know run you know run roughshod and I think it's time to, to turn it around. And, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do is mm-hmm. I'm starting animal-based nutrition network.com. We're including healthcare providers and we're mm-hmm. policymakers and, you know, provide and, and people into ranching and, you know, hopefully some regenerative ranchers and trying to mm-hmm. really just st- fight back. Cause I think we need to, and I, you know, and I hate to be, I've never, never been a political person, but it becomes, a, <laughs> you know, you darn sure have to at some point, you know, I think it's getting to that point. And so, well, I think we've got enough uh, information now that we can, uh, uh, quote, fight back intelligently. I think we can can make some good points. And we're seeing now a lot of vegans actually admit that they've gone back to eating meat and they've given their reasons. It was an experiment. It was mel- well meant. You know, there are a lot of people that just uh, their hearts go out to animals. I'm an animal lover. In fact, I was zoology major in college. Um, but um, I think we just have to, to face that we are apex predators. This is our role in the world, and, but we can be the most compassionate, thoughtful apex predators on earth if we just put our minds to it. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, we, you know, I mean, most animals in the wild do not have a particularly nice existence or death. Uh, right. It's usually very painful and prolonged and uh, you know, and what we do is far, far, far more humane. Now, uh, you know, we can we can argue that the uh, the uh, in, intensification in, in the uh, mass scale of agriculture, you know, can make some of the life for some of the animals less than than ideal for the period of time they're in life. And we can certainly work on that. And I, I I do think you know having guys like Joel Salatin and others showing us that that we can increase our capacity, our soil capacity, our, our pasture capacity by four or five, six, seven, eight hundred percent by proper techniques. And we could have vast, vast herds roaming the plains, uh, Mm -hmm. feeding us, you know, living a a well cared for life, even though it's, you know, three years instead of, well, I mean, if we look at a wild ruminant, I mean, the wild ruminant is going to last 12 weeks, 50% of the time they get eaten as youth, you know, so so we Mm -hmm. actually give them a longer life than they would likely have, you know, based on average than, than these other animals do. And so, and they can heal the earth at the same time. This right, and, and they can make a tremendous, possible. tremendous impact. Yeah. Yeah, if, if we can do that. And so I think we just have to, you know, we have to fight for that. And I would like to see a lot of the people that are considering, particularly the youth that are considering, you know, maybe I want to go vegan, plant-based, and mm-hmm. do that stuff to really look at both sides of the argument. And, and, and hopefully many of them will come to the, the conclusion that I have that it would be much better, much more positive to fight for you know, positively fight for regenerative agriculture rather than try to prevent the whole world from eating meat because that's just not ever going to happen. And we can't do it. We, we could never have, we could never support the, the planet on a plant-based diet simply because we would not, we would ever be nutrient deficient. I mean, the studies have been that's already right. looked at. We could provide maybe more calories, but mm-hmm. the calories would be devoid of nutrition uh, that we would need. And we would see uh, just a, lar- a sick populace. It's even sicker than we are now. And maybe, you know, maybe more of them. So we'd have just more sick people running around, which is not I think this may be related, but it seems that the the average height of Americans is reducing even if you take into account immigrants that are shorter than most Americans. And you'll find that in some other countries, they're actually much taller. The average is up to like six foot two, which is very tall, right, here. So I think I think we're starting to see the effects of certainly processed foods. And I do have concerns that the plant-based diet will uh, further that. Yeah, so, we see there, there's a number of studies looking at on children, looking at children on a plant-based diet. And in general, they, they end up being a little bit shorter. You know, they, 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 they delay hitting milestones with growth. Uh, and that's been documented a number of times. And so I, it's fascinating. I did not know the U.S. average height population was, was actually going backwards. I know that... Uh, I think I'm our sorry. average is 5'10 now. Okay, so I think it's... it's yeah. uh, you know, back, you know, dawn of agriculture, where we were probably five foot, you know, in some places it was four foot six or something like that. And interestingly, the supposedly the largest population that ever lived that we have skeletal records on was a group called the Gravettians that lived in Central Europe about 30, 40,000 years ago. 
and their primary job was to they were mammoth hunters they were expert mammoth hunters and they were the tallest people that ever lived and they were you know, I've, seen, I've, seen, I've seen back in the um fossil record um average height is high as six feet though yeah but these guys were six foot two and they were in the fossil ah, record so, the the right. and so we have gotten shorter and then you know you know when we adopted agriculture we dropped by about six inches wow. as well as brain shrinking wow. and then we're, we're the, we're, we're, Weren't the Plains Indians that were hunting the buffaloes estimated to be quite a bit taller too than That's what the I heard. average European that came over? Yeah, the Cheyenne tribe, uh, I believe it was the Cheyenne tribe, was the tallest tribe at the time on earth. And I think they were almost six feet tall, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, the Dinka, the, the, the Maasai, the Nilotic Africans also running around six feet. Again, these are all people that are you know, they, they depend on animal food for the majority of the nourishment. So, and as we know that uh, population height is a, proxy, is a proxy measure for nutritional status overall. That's why we see so many poor, poor developing nations where the average height is very small. And we see all the nutritional deficiencies, the rickets, the scurvy, the vitamin, you know, the iron deficiency, which is rampant. Um, uh -huh. Well, there's, there's actually a, get this, there is actually a paper online. You might want to check this out. Uh, that found that uh, animal source vitamin A plus iron was as effective in as growth hormone in constitutionally uh, delayed growth. Hmm. Fascinating, right? Um, so uh, I actually did this with a kid. I don't know if that's what did it, but this was a kid who was uh, told he would have to be on growth hormone and he didn't want it. He said he'd heard about the side effects. He didn't want to do that. He's an early teen. So I suggested to him and his parents, well, would you be willing to take a little cocktail? A little, I think at that time it was uh, cod liver oil plus um, iron because I, I did his ferritin level. It was quite low. And he said, A okay. And within a year, his endocrinologist said that he was right on track to become to grow to be about 5'10". So they said case closed pretty much at that point. Um, so I don't know if that's what did it, who knows what other factors, but I really found it fascinating because both of those things, heme iron and also um, animal derived vitamin A, uh, both, both of those come from iron, from uh, animals. And both of those are things that we've reduced a lot in plant-based diets. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that, that many people aren't aware of, that there's a difference between animal-derived vitamin A, which just comes in the retinol form, and, yes. and, and plant-based, which comes in the, the, yes. the carotenoid or the beta-carotene form. And many people have a difficult time making that conversion. They do. Uh, yes, so, in fact, up to 50% in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that may be one of the reasons why some people are able to last longer on a, on a plant-based diet than others, and others just immediately get sick within months and can't, can't do it is because you maybe that vitamin A conversion issue. And so it's very, very interesting to see. And so you could equally have told that kid to eat a steak and a piece of liver and he would have been probably just as fine. Just as good <laughs> but he wanted the liver probably. Nobody does anymore, sadly. But yeah, yeah, yeah man, that's interesting. I, I have to admit, I don't eat much liver. I have occasionally have a chicken liver at a Brazilian yeah. steakhouse or something like that. I had some up in the, uh, up at the carniv carnivore convention we had last year that Amber O'Hearn put on and they had a butcher and we had all this specialized uh, different cuts of meat and and so and a lot of organ meat in there and so i tried all that and so i thought it was thought it was okay at best <laughs> <laughs> i think some of it's just we've lost the art of cooking liver i was at a restaurant yeah. in california this is probably a few years ago at this point they still had liver and onions on the menu mm -hmm. so i'm like well i gotta order that just uh, <laughs> like there's no way i can't pass well, on that because you, you know i've i've you know when i when i'm going to france i'll have foie gras and i mean i, I don't oh. mind that at all it tastes pretty good you know so but I mean, there's a lot of people that don't like the way they make foie gras because they uh -huh. you know they basically feed the feed the geese mm -hmm. grains to fatten up their they liver give fatty them. liver disease which is how you do it to humans too right yeah <laughs> <laughs> looks a lot the same yep and let's uh where do you uh Tell people where they can find you, where your practice is. Uh, are you spe are you doing any speaking this year? I know you've you've you've, oh, been, yeah. you've been on doing some some. Actually, I think first. you and I will be joining each other up in Seattle. Oh, awesome! Okay, cool. So I'll see you up there next year. I'm heading to Paleo Effects uh, today. I'm flying. I'm gonna do the podcast. Cool. I got some more push ups to knock out. Get on the rowing machine, <laughs> finish a workout, and then I'm gonna hop on a plane and and go to Paleo Effects uh, and, and hang out and speak. And then I'll be up in Seattle the the following weekend. So it'll be nice to meet you in person. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Uh, me too. Yeah, yeah. 
And oh, I forgot to make one mention going back to what I was talking about uh, with the kids in the diet and the antifungals. I may not have made it clear. Basically, it was getting rid of candida. And if you get on a low carb diet, you can get rid of candida. So I think I think this is kind of an important part of what these uh, low carb, paleo, carnivore, all of these uh, diets basically are helping us clean up the microbiome. Yeah, I mean, that's good. I'm glad you clarified that because I would hate to see people rushing out to put kids on antifungals for, for oh, no. because Don't I think that, that uh, just get rid of the candida. Yeah, the antifungals yeah. are pretty nasty on the liver and uh, there's a lot, yes. of, a, lot of, a lot of issues, particularly the oral ones, you know, and uh, yes. so... Uh, yeah, I, yeah, like I said, yeah, it's it's amazing how diet can. There's so many. Again, there's so many things we don't know. We've we've spent so much time, money, and research on how to make new drugs, and we spend relatively little time on diet and disease. And I think we we're missing the boat here in a, in a huge way. And as you know, both you and I, med medical education and curriculum was was often largely <laughs> developed with the aid of pharmaceutical and industry input. And so. We, yeah. we, are, we, we are freshly minted physicians out there with a prescription pad ready to, ready to serve, right? Ready to write more prescriptions. And, it's true. Uh, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Exactly. And so it's good to see, like I said, it's great to see more and more physicians. We've had a number of great physicians on that are all adopting a lifestyle-based, nutrition-based yes. approach. And I think their patients appreciate that. Um, and I think it's, hopefully it's a trend that will continue. And I hopefully, you know, you know, in the end, uh, the good guys win, hopefully. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Zach, any last minute words? I know Ann's, Ann's got to actually probably see some patients today, so we don't <laughs> keep you too long. Probably shouldn't borrow too much of our time. No, thanks for coming on. It's been great. I think, uh, you know, this will be, I believe, episode 117. And you, oh, even, even with 116 episodes prior, uh -huh. you brought a unique perspective. So, uh that's always good to see, and I'm sure our listeners will be excited for this one. Oh, great. I hope, I hope it's helpful. That's, that's bottom line. And I really appreciate you folks hosting me today. It was delightful. So. Well, likewise. Great pleasure having you on. Good meeting you, and I look forward to, to shaking your hand in person uh, in about a week or so. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks. See you then. Take care. Hey, folks. Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.